Hi everybody, welcome back. So I'm going to talk about mentalization. And if this is something that you can wrap your head around and begin to practice this construct um, in, in, with yourself and in your relationships, um, I, I think it's the, the, the most important um, ingredient in a healthy relationship. And it has many parts to it, so I'm going to break it down. But again, um, you know, if nothing else, when I'm when I'm doing couples work with with folks, this is this is kind of the bedrock. This is kind of the pay dirt in terms of where I put the majority of my focus with people. So mentalization, I mentioned it in my last video, and, and I had a couple of people say, "What is that? Talk about it more." And I, I'm excited to talk about it because it is critical. And it's something along the lines of, like, let's say, mindfulness. It's not a state you achieve. You don't you don't achieve a state of mentalizing or, or in a mentalized state. It's a practice. It's an ongoing dynamic practice that you're working through. Um, it, it's, it's a relational construct. We all have the capacity to do it. Some of us innately do it better than others. Some of us have to really work at it. Okay. If you've grown up in a mentalized home, mentalizing home, you might be better at this. Um, but that's not necessarily the case. Again, for all of us, it's it's a practice, um, and we have to kind of make a commitment to it. So let me tell you what it is instead of just talking about it. Um, it's basically the, the capacity to, one part of it is the capacity to simultaneously be self-aware and other aware. So what, if I'm in a, if I'm having a, a conversation with a loved one, it's, it's the capacity to be thinking about what am I thinking, feeling, needing right now, while I'm simultaneously aware of what the other person might be thinking, feeling, or needing at that moment. Okay. Um, so it's self-awareness and it's other awareness. It's 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 self-compassion and it's empathy. It's self and other. And it's that balance between the two. It's not all about me. It's not all about you. It's that balance that exists between the two. And being able to work through practice to get skilled at staying in that um, um, in that balance, okay, between between self and other. But what's inherent in that, obviously, is the is a boundary. Right, and this is something I notice a lot of times when I'm working, especially in couples work, um, is that boundary has gotten collapsed. Um, if he really loved me, he wouldn't have done that. Um, um, he should know what I think. She should know how I feel. Uh, she should know what I want. He should know what I want. Um, they should know better. Okay. Now, is are, are those statements never true? No, I mean certainly that we can talk about that. And, and but but what I find that happens a lot of times, and I know I'm guilty of this too, is in relationships we tend to collapse that boundary between self and other. And if we're not thinking and feeling the same thing about a certain issue, we feel missed. We can feel slighted. We can begin to doubt. Maybe this isn't the right person for me. Um, you know, I came home and I told you this story about, you know, what happened with my boss and what a jerk they are. And, you know, you can see that they're kind of a jerk, but you can also see the other side. Why aren't you, you're not seeing it the way that I'm seeing it. Uh, that must mean there's something wrong with us. That must mean there's something wrong with you. And so what's inherent in a, in a, in a healthy mentalizing relationship is we are not each other's appendages. Okay. I am not dating or married to or in a relationship with my arm, my leg, the other half of my brain, okay? Um, so do we, is there such thing as goodness of fit? Sure, we want there to be a goodness of fit. We, we tend to like people that, and we are attracted and we have healthy relationships with people that share our values, but they may not share our thoughts and our feelings in the moment and how often we get injured by that, okay? And then um, take that hurt and think, you know, kind of the worst. So what's implied and what's inherent in a mentalizing relationship is that boundary between self and other and not seeing each other as a, an appendage. I gave an example in my last video of a guy married 56 years, 42 of those 56 years, came home every Friday to roast beef and a beer and uh, just walked in, sat down to his dinner. It was there, never had to think about it, never had to question it. Year 42 walks in, the wife's not there. There's no roast beef, there's no beer. A note that says I'm off to play tennis. He took a moment and was able to say, okay, he was pissed, okay, and he was irate, and he wanted to say, you don't play tennis. What the hell are you thinking? Um, where's my beer? I work so hard for us. I come home. I expect this. You know, you can't just pull this on me. But he was able to slow down, and when she walked in, he was able to take a genuine stance of curiosity, which is another 
component of mentalization. And he said, tell me about tennis. What, what made you want to go play? How did it go? A genuine stance of curiosity, not a checking of the box, not a, I said all the right things. And so therefore, because I said the right thing, they should respond appropriately to me. A genuine stance of curiosity. Okay. And that can really only exist when there's a true space between ourselves and the other person and we can actually see them and then be genuinely curious about them. And, and genuine is a very important word, right? Because we can say, and I have lots of couples that say, I ask her every day how her day was, what the hell does she want? Okay. Well, that doesn't sound very genuine. Or I asked him five times if he, no, I mean, a genuine stance of curiosity is first of all, um, that there's more than one answer. So for a lot of couples get stuck in this too, where, um, hey, do you want to go to the movies tonight? Sounds like a question, right? And you may really want to go to the movie. And so you ask that question, you want the answer to be yes. And when the answer is no, you get hurt. Well, in doing that, you weren't genuinely curious, right? You were basically saying, I would like to go to the movies tonight. Can we go? Would you go with me? Okay. That's different than, would you like to go to the movies tonight? And then your partner says, no, you get hurt. And suddenly, you know, you're kind of off in the other room thinking they never want to do what I want to do. They don't care about me. They are never really making an effort. Well, you asked a question, but a question has more than one answer. Okay. So again, genuine curiosity is I'm really interested in what you think and feel. I'm really interested about whether or not you want to go see a movie. Why don't you want to go? Um, or Again, be clear. This goes to another point that I want to speak to, which is transparency. Transparency is a big piece of mentalization, okay? Because again, what you what you're what you're trying to not do, but we often do, is we um, leave people hanging. We put people on the hook. They've they've pissed us off. They didn't show up well for us, so I'm going to ignore them, and I don't know when I'm going to speak to them again, or I'm going to you know get in the car and drive away and I'll come back when I want to come back. Or, no, I don't feel like talking about this now because I don't really like how you looked at me or spoke to me. Um, again, is this common? Absolutely. I'm guilty of these things. Okay. Is it a mentalizing place where I'm really looking at, okay, um, we can hurt each other in this. We hurt each other all the time. Relationships matter because they're vulnerable. Okay. That's why they matter. Um, so, you know, and we're going to be hurt by people. We're going to hurt people, but our goal really should be minimizing that as much as possible. So the transparency, for example, might be, um, the, your, your partner walks in, they look at you funny, you are already having a bad day and you say, you know what? Um, I don't know exactly what I'm thinking and feeling right now. I don't know how much of this is me. I don't know how much of this is us. Um, let me just take a little time and, you know, think about it, you know, work it through, go for a walk, whatever. And can we talk after dinner? And that last part of the sentence is really important because I've got a lot of couples that will do the first part. Um, I'm not sure what I'm thinking or feeling right now. I'll get back to you. Well, in some ways we're leaving them hanging on the hook. Okay. Our hope is that we're not trying to evoke anxiety in our partner, even if they have evoked anxiety or upset in us. And so by being able to say, let's talk about it after dinner, or can we speak about it in the morning? Can I sleep on it and let's talk after breakfast tomorrow? Bookend it, okay? Um, it, it's a loving, caring, authentic, genuine um, concern, okay, for the relationship and for not leaving your, your partner in a state of anxiety of, I don't know exactly what I did and I don't know exactly what's wrong and I don't know exactly when we'll ever talk about this or what I can expect or we, we a lot of times we, you know we can get a little sadistic right and be like well you know you showed up a half an hour late and now you want to talk about what's wrong with me and I don't feel like it so I'll figure it I'll let you know when I let you know does it happen yeah is that a healthy part of a relationship no is it a mentalizing stance no so transparency um being transparent about the fact that you might not really know what you're thinking and feeling, and that's okay. You get the right and the space to figure that out. Um, but being transparent in how you deliver that to your loved one and say, um, I'm not trying to make you anxious. I'm not trying to make you angry. I'm not trying to leave you hanging. I'm not trying to ignore you. 
Um, I, I just need time to cool down or I need time to settle into what I'm thinking and feeling. And we'll talk soon. We'll talk at dinner. We'll talk tomorrow morning and bookend it and give the time. If you're still not ready by breakfast, that's okay. But circle back at breakfast and say, I know I said we were going to talk. I haven't quite figured it out yet. Let's talk after dinner tonight. Okay. So again, that transparency is really key. This kind of segues into another part of mentalization, which is being responsive versus being reactive. Okay. Um, I talk a lot about slowing down to the speed of wisdom. And really that's the, um, the kind of the magic of, of a relationship is being able to operate at the speed of wisdom where we're not operating with first thought all the time. What I mean by first thought is, again, my partner walks in, my parent walks in, my kiddo walks in, whatever. I'm already kind of in a bad mood. They don't look so happy. My first thought is, oh, great. You know, this is what I need. Or, oh, they're pissed at me too. Or here we go again. Or whatever it is. First thoughts are not always the most accurate. A lot of times there are reactions. Okay, Sometimes they are, and we might need to come back to them and say, I had it right the first time. But if we can slow down to the speed of wisdom and start to generate, okay, what's my second, third, fourth, fifth thought? Okay, My fifth thought might be, you know, I was already in a bad mood. Maybe they're having a bad day. Maybe we just need to sit and kind of support each other. That might be fifth thought. First thought might have been, oh, great. I'm already in a bad mood. They look like they're in a bad mood. I'm sick of their bad moods, and I don't want to hear, okay, whatever. So slowing down to that speed of wisdom, working on being responsive rather than reactive, not necessarily always going with first thought, okay? Also, I have a clinician friend that, that always says this, and I think it's great, talk, talking about, does this need to be said at all? Does this need to be said by me? And does it need to be said right now? When we're reactive, we're not pumping the brakes enough to think, is this the time to say this to my loved one? Or do I even need to be the one to say this to my loved one? Or does this need to be said at all? Can this just be like something we just let go? Um, when you can slow down and even ask yourselves those three questions, you've put enough kind of natural breaks into the situation where you're going to be more naturally responsive because you're being more mindful. Yeah, I do need to bring this up now. Yeah, it is up to me to say this. And yeah, um, this is something they need to hear. But again, we tend to go with first thought, reactivity, reacting off our feeling state, assuming what their feeling state is, broken down that, that, that we've kind of collapsed that boundary between self and other, um, where we're not seeing them as a, as a real live differentiated human being with rights to feel and think whatever they think and feel. Everything has kind of collapsed and suddenly we're on our, on each other. Um, door number three is another concept I use with mentalization and that's kind of goes along with a little bit of what I've been talking about. But door number three is, um, again, responding and slowing down to generate options. So um, an example might be um, you've, you've gone to go get your morning coffee and they've at the drive through and they've screwed it up and you kind of feel like, God, nothing goes right for me. You know, I, I'm just, I'm just a loser. Nothing goes right for me. And you're on the freeway and a car cuts you off. And you think, what am I invisible? Like I'm so unworthy. I'm, I don't even take up, so I'm not even worthy of the space I take up. That's door number one thought. Door number two thought might be, what a jerk that they screwed up my coffee. What a jerk that they purposefully cut me off. Okay. That's door number two thought. Door number three thought might be, maybe that car cut me off because they're trying to race their loved one to the hospital and they're in a panic. And in that case, please take my spot ahead of me, right? So if we don't know the answer, it's interesting how we often kind of generate the most negative answer a lot of the time rather than being able to say, well, since I don't know why this person cut me off, could I maybe assume that they're in an emergency, that there's something wrong? And in that case, I would have empathy and let them in and let them take that space in front of me on the freeway right? We do this in our relationships too. You know, this person, you know, uh, ignored me because um, they came in from work and they're ignoring me because, you know, I'm, I'm just not worth anything. They don't see me as being a worthy spouse or partner. Um, or they came in and they're being their narcissistic jerk self. Okay, that's door number one. Door number two. Door number three is, you know, I haven't felt that good today and they're coming in. They don't look so good. Maybe they had a bad day. Let me just slow down and either check this out or just let this unfold. So I'm always about kind of generating options, slowing down to the speed of wisdom, responding rather than reacting, 
recognizing that the other person gets to have their their own thoughts and feelings and it's not necessarily a reflection of the relationship for me and real quick I want to give one really good example of the best example I ever heard of mentalization it wasn't in a romantic relationship it was a mother-daughter relationship my mom back in the mid 90s bought all the girls in my family that uh, tickets to this women's series that was being held downtown and Jane Goodall, who, if you don't know who that is, she's the, kind of the chimp lady, the lady that lived out with the monkeys and studied them in their environment. And she gave a fascinating talk. And at the end, she was answering questions. And one of the questions was, what made you, how, what made you be Jane Goodall? Like, what, what gave you the sense of confidence to think that you could go off into a world that had no women in it at the time in science and certainly not in those naturalistic observ observatory type environments? And, and do this and write about it and study it. And she didn't even bat an eye. I think she just, she knew what drove her to be Jane Goodall. And she said, you know, when I was little, I grew up in a flat in London. And I was always, from the time I was little, just obsessed with, you know, creatures, insects, bugs, whatever I could find. She said, we were in a flat in London. We had no pets. There weren't a lot of animals around us, but I loved them. There were these worms that lived in these flower pots outside her flat. And she would play with these worms, she named these worms, and one night she grabbed the worms and put them in her bed. And her mom comes to tuck her in and realizes, oh geez, the bed is covered in dirt and worms, and says, Jane, these worms have to go in back to their bed, they have to go back to their habitat, let's go put them back in bed. And the mom got her cleaned up, cleaned up the sheets, didn't freak out, didn't get, oh my God, Jane, you know, just said, Jane, these worms have to go over here, this is where they live. Fast forward a couple of years and she's in kindergarten and her class is taking a class trip to a nearby farm and Jane is ecstatic, right? Can't contain herself the week or two before. And her mom goes as a, as a parental chaperone on this trip. They go to the farm, little Jane's seeing pigs and cows for the first time in real life and horses and she's looking, she just can't get over it. And they go in the chicken coop and the farmer says, now this chicken's about to lay an egg. And Jane's like, oh my God, you know, like this is like Nirvana for her. So they circle through the, the, the chicken coop and they all leave. And Jane sneaks off and goes back into the chicken coop and hot, positions herself where she won't disturb the chickens. But she can, has a bird's eye view of being able to watch this chicken lay an egg. And, um, but is out of sight of everybody else. And of course, people notice little Jane's missing. This starts this frantic search. I think it was almost an hour that she was missing. You know, they've come to the chicken coop many times. She's not responding. She's glued to this chicken. They're about to go comb the lake nearby. They looked everywhere. They can't find her. Somehow the chicken lays the egg and Jane gets the egg in her hand and comes out of the chicken coop. And she says she looks up and on the top of the hill, she said it looked like hundreds of angry giants with faces of anguish, like running towards her. And she's standing there with this egg, watching these angry giants come at her. And br her mother breaks through the pack and gets to her first and gets in front of her and notices that Jane's standing there with an egg. And she plops down in front of Jane and says, tell me how the chicken laid the egg. And I have to tell you that I don't think there was a dry eye in that entire enormous auditorium. Uh, why? Because, well, first of all, we will all want Jane's mom. <laughs> Second of all, we all want to be Jane's mom, right? There was plenty of time to collapse that space and be like, you scared me. You, you can't do this. Look at this commotion you've caused. The police are here. We've been looking for hours. You've put all these people out. I've been terrified. And she, you know, there was the mother, I think intuitively, most of us would have, oh my God, grabbed our kid and hugged them and then been angry and been sad and then been embarrassed for what they had created for all these other people. But there was one moment for Jane's mom to get the, the genuine curiosity and to not collapse that space, but to see Jane as her own little differentiated little five or six year old self and take a true genuine stance of curiosity and table all of her valid feelings of distress, terror, fear, um, uh, anguish, um, embarrassment, um, whatever she was feeling, all of those valid feelings, she was able to table those for a minute and step into a genuine stance of curiosity with her daughter. And Jane attributed that to what gave her the confidence to uh, continue with her own curiosity about things. Had her mom squelched that 
And all of a sudden curiosity got intermingled with shame and distress and anguish and terror and trauma. And right. I mean, maybe Jane wouldn't have been Jane, but she was able to recognize like that was the moment that, that, um, that, that she was able to step into herself, um, and, and, and further along that path of curiosity. So, I'll come back to this. There's a lot to speak about, but again, just remembering self and other, the boundary between self and other, being transparent, um, operating at the speed of wisdom, responding rather than reacting, um, allowing um, our loved ones to have their own thoughts and feelings and taking a genuine stance of curiosity about what those experiences are. Um, It's a good place to start. Thanks, guys.